well, thank you, Gary and Roger and Dieter. Um, it has been just an extraordinary pleasure for me and my family to be here. I should introduce my daughter, Emily, and my son, William, uh, who have enjoyed the pleasures of being here in the Vanze. And um, I think the three of us have found this to be an extraordinary experience. Uh, I should say in particular uh, about Dieter Grimm that uh, he, while he is a very modest person, he is uh, one of the great constitutional scholars and judges alive. Uh, and um, he has been a very special figure in my life, uh, kind of an older brother. You may have heard of us, the Brothers Grimm. <laughs> uh, you, <laughs> uh, you did not know that, uh, that <laughs> Dieter had a Korean brother, but um, uh, we have uh, shared experiences as deans and as professors and, and in the government. Uh, service and uh, understand the, the challenges of it. And it's uh, because of his uh, example that I have been able to develop these kinds of close ties with Berlin. I especially am grateful to the American Academy, to Gary, to uh, Pamela, to Laura Zager, and her team for their extraordinary um, uh, hospitality to my whole family. And uh, I hope to uh, at least give some of it back to you uh, in this lecture today. To Roger, <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, re uh, say that I met Lloyd Cutler for the first time 31 years ago, and I have two very distinct memories of him, one which I will say now and one uh, a little later. Uh, he, of course, was a graduate of Yale and Yale Law School. He was the uh, quintessential super lawyer of Washington. He founded the great law firm, uh, which Roger and his colleagues here uh, our members, uh, which has become a genuinely global firm, and he was the counsel to two presidents, President Carter and Clinton. And he played an extraordinary role because of his belief in the ability of law and lawyers to solve the world's most challenging problems. Uh, I first met him when I was uh, in my 20s, but um, perhaps my most memorable experience with Lloyd was <coughs> uh, the day that he was chosen by President Clinton to be the White House counsel on his second tour, and it turned out that that day, his first day of work, he had previously been scheduled to speak at a Yale Law School event in which the other speaker was myself. And um, uh, I went there, and uh, it was a subject of uh, national security law, and so I brought a book I had written on the subject. And we both spoke, and then uh, Lloyd said, what you said was interesting. Have you written anything on this subject? And I said, let me give you my book. <laughs> you know, please twist my arm. <laughs> uh, and he gra graciously accepted it. Two, two days later, my former boss, Justice Blackman, uh, retired from the Supreme Court, and he went to the White House to extend his resignation to President Clinton, where, of course, he was met by Lloyd Cutler. And I called Justice Blackman and was congratulating him, and he said, you know, Harold, Lloyd Cutler in his office had only one book, and it was yours. <laughs> For which I am always grateful to Lloyd Cutler, and I have never, I never clarified with Justice Blackman the reason why this was true. Now, as uh, Roger and uh, Dieter explained, I've spent now 30 years as an international law professor, 20 as a human rights lawyer, 10 in the U.S. government, and five as a dean. The last five, four years <coughs> were extraordinarily challenging. And I just give you some pictures uh, on the upper left uh, representing the United States at the Human Rights Council of the UN in Geneva, the top right in Moscow with the National Security Council's legal advisor, Avril Haines, who has been designated as my successor at the State Department, in the bottom left in uh, Afghanistan, the bottom right, uh, Guantanamo, where I first went in 1991 in an undisclosed military location <laughs> uh, at the Parthenon during the financial crisis <coughs> in Greece with Secretary Albright going to the funeral of Kim Dae-jung, the uh, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and then I appeared in many courts, the International Court of Justice in The Hague, uh, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the uh, uh, African Court of People and Human Rights in uh, Arusha, Tanzania, and the uh, International Criminal Court in The Hague, 
where I was one of the leaders of our uh, delegation. Uh, there are many happy memories. This is the most famous. <laughs> Secretary uh, Clinton um, was going to Libya after the fall of Gaddafi, and they gave her a military transport plane in Malta. And in the middle of the plane, they had four nice seats. And uh, because I was the uh, third ranking person on the plane, I sat next to her and we got on and the press was taking pictures and so it was a little awkward, you know, we're in, and so we were all texting. So I texted to her, uh, look over your shoulder. <laughs> uh, and that is the text that she is reading in this <laughs> now famous meme of text from Hillary. And I worked on uh, many, many issues. One of them is uh, Chen Guangchen, the uh, blind Chinese activist who was in the U.S. Embassy, uh, who we spent 14 days um, getting out of uh, China. Uh, some were inherited, 9-11 issue, the drones issue, Guantanamo. We were present during uh, the unfolding of others, Arab awakening, uh, numerous human rights challenges, international cr criminal justice. And then there are many issues that struck us as quintessentially of the future, cyberspace, um, private international law, global economic transactions, uh, the environment, public health, and then what might be called acts of man and God. Uh, acts of God being defined as uh, that which no reasonable God would do. Um, for example, uh, in Haiti, a massive earthquake. Um, in Japan, uh, the meltdown of a nuclear reactor in response to um, a uh, earthquake followed by a tsunami. And then um, the extraordinary uh, WikiLeaks, uh, which put us all in an extraordinary position. Imagine if all of your emails for the previous 10 years were suddenly released and you had thought that they were confidential and your choice was to try to repair the damage from the release or go on with your other work. Uh, that's what we faced. Um, someone said that uh, this was a, uh, WikiLeaks was a disaster without uh, any redeeming value, to which one of my colleagues said that he had come to a meeting with a foreign minister who he noticed was unusually well-dressed. And he commented on this, and then the foreign minister said, well, WikiLeaks said I was perpetually unkempt. <laughs> <laughs> so this was taken as one of the few positive things that uh, happened. Uh, I played many roles. I was the managing partner of a law firm of about 200 lawyers, 400 staff broken into 24 offices divided on a regional and functional basis. I was the general counsel of the State Department, which meant that I was the counselor to the Secretary of State. And we do things the general counsel do of any large entity. We buy buildings, they just happen to be in Afghanistan. We get visas, they just happen to be from Iraq. Uh, I manage conflicts among different parts of the State Department, which are very far flung. And perhaps the most distinctive role was as a spokesperson and conscience of the U.S. government on international law. Uh, the position of my office, uh, which is called legal advisor, spelled after the same spelling of the British legal advisor of the foreign office, suggests that you are the government's uh, main authority on international law issues. And this meant that I was also the defender of the U.S. government on these issues in any forum in which international legal issues were raised. So that is how I appeared in all the courts. When we were sued or challenged, uh, it was my job to appear, which I think uh, placed me in a very unusual situation. I think those of you who do criminal law do not find it unusual that you could study the same body of law for many years but when you're a prosecutor, when you were a defense counsel, when you were a judge or a professor, different parts of that body of law have more prominence to you. But many in my line of work didn't understand that you have different roles when you are an uh, international lawyer in the government. And so I considered myself to have the identical commitments. Uh, I'm a man of peace. I'm a scholar and teacher of international law. I'm a defender of human rights. And I, I happen to be a lawyer for a nation at war. And <clears throat> I was often asked, how could you as a human rights lawyer criticize torture and defend <coughs> drones? To which my answer was sad but simple. Uh, all torture is illegal, no matter how used. 
all killing is regrettable, but some killing, particularly in wartime, is lawful if you follow the laws of war. So some targeting may, on balance, uh, defend or preserve more human rights, uh, particularly if it targets only those who would harm innocent civilians. So if you're going to be a government lawyer, it is your inescapable duty, sad but necessary, to police the line between lawful and unlawful killing and those killings that do or do not advance the cause of human rights. Now, you may draw those lines in the wrong place and people may criticize you for doing so, but nevertheless, it's your job, and if you're not prepared to do that job, you shouldn't play that role. Now, <coughs> a further complication is that the world was changing. Many of my academic views were expressed uh, during the Cold War. We now live in the post-Cold post War world where not just the Berlin Wall has fallen, but uh, also the Twin Towers. We live in what Tom Friedman calls a flat world of empowered individuals uh, who can uh, both uh, generate outcomes and uh, create threats with only their own computer. And then, perhaps most difficult for me, an extraordinarily toxic U.S. domestic political environment where the cooperation between the branches has virtually stalemated, which led me to a question and the answer that I want to give you tonight. The question is very simple. It's called the tennis court problem. <laughs> the first time I went to the government, someone said, you know, going to the government is like going on to a tennis court. And you're given a tennis racket, and the balls start to come over the net, and they say, return the balls. So first they're coming very fast, and you can hardly return any. And then you start to understand the pace, and you return most of them. And then you start to think, you know, I shouldn't just be returning these balls willy-nilly. I should do them with some kind of plan. So you hit them all to the left side. And then at a certain moment, it dawns on you, wh why am I not throwing the balls? <laughs> <You know? laughs> why am I being utterly reactive? Do I have a strategy uh, that allows <coughs> us to address <coughs> the problems that I'm facing? And can I try to use that strategy uh, in a consistent and a coherent way? That doesn't mean that every b ball gets hit with that strategy, but at least you have a plan. And the question is, what was that plan? And my answer is simple, international law as smart power. That was the plan. And more fundamentally, it has a three-part uh, uh, face. Engage, translate, and leverage. Which means what? Uh, that our foreign policy should lead us to engage around our values with our allies, both public and private. And then we should translate. So some say, and I disagree with this, there is no difference between Obama and Bush. And I would say there's all the difference in the world because one applied what I would call the black hole approach and the other apply a translation approach. This deserves a little bit more discussion about which I'll do in a second, but imagine this. On my very first day of work, I've been there for less than an hour and I'm thinking, well, you know, I've been an international lawyer my, most of my life. What's going to come in that I'm not going to expect? And someone came in and said, you know, we've got a frozen embryo of a panda bear, which is owned by a large Asian nation. And it's being transported, and it's at a border. And the question is, if it is attached, is it entitled to foreign sovereign immunity? <laughs> <laughs> and I, <laughs> And I thought to myself, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> My second thought was, when I return to New Haven, many uh, law students will. <laughs> Where after I uh, developed a little game, I played with myself, which was, how quickly in the day would a problem arise that I had never thought of? And the answer is always before 9 o'clock. <laughs> Which led me to this question. Um, was there something fundamental that I was seeing? And I started to realize it's this. Uh, 21st century challenges, 20th century law. Most of our treaties were developed in the foundational period after World War II, uh, Bretton Woods. Uh, most of our national security laws in the United States were developed after Vietnam. <coughs> it's now 40 years later, 
And most of the problems that now arise simply were not thought of by the framers. For example, the framers of the Geneva Conventions <coughs> did not think uh, about whether someone sitting at a computer terminal changing a zero to an O constitutes an armed attack. I'm sorry, they did not think of this question. So, uh, and I could give you, and I will give you many more examples. 20th century laws, 21st century challenges. There are two possible responses. Number one is to say, they didn't think about it. Those laws are quaint. They're outmoded. It's a black hole. Law does not apply. We can do whatever we want. That is one possible approach. In fact, I think that was an approach that I would attribute to the last administration of the United States. The other approach is to say, there are laws to apply, but we don't know exactly how they apply. So in the words of Montesquieu, we will apply the spirit of the laws and translate it to meet these 21st century challenges. We can be accused of translating it incorrectly, right? There's always a better or worse translation in the eyes of the translator uh, or someone who knows the original meaning. <laughs> but there is a huge qualitative difference between saying that there is no law to apply and trying to translate the law that exists to cover a situation, because the first is to deny the relevance of law, and the second is to live in a law-governed society. And then the third element is leverage. Can you blend law with other tools to produce certain policy outcomes? Which means that military force is a tool, but it's not the only tool. Diplomacy, development, technology, markets, international institutions, public-private partnerships and the like also are tools. And here is the question. Can you engage with other partners, public and private, translate a rule of law and make it the core of a governance regime and then leverage other instruments to achieve certain policy outcomes? Now, this is well known. Um, Joe Nye calls it soft power, or my colleague at Yale, Paul Kennedy, talked about the dilemma of the great powers. Those who try to dominate the world using hard power, like military force, experience imperial overstretch, they're tapped out, uh, they start to lose their authority, uh, and then they're replaced by another great power. So smart power, which is using these tools in combination, with military force as an element, but not the only element, and using law as a source of legitimacy is a strategy. And Hillary Clinton called this early in the Obama term, smart power. And surprisingly, it was widely derided as a slogan without content. Now, what I want to argue is it does have content. And in fact, it is the doctrine for which this administration should be known an emerging Obama-Clinton doctrine. It was President Obama. Look at how young he is in this picture. <laughs> uh, that's another part of this, by the way, is that uh, <laughs> these are extraordinarily taxing situations, um, and people are just trying to survive them, much less uh, present a coherent theory. But in his very first speech, the inaugural address, President Obama said, a new era of engagement has begun where respecting the law and living our values doesn't make us weaker, it makes us safer and stronger. And then Sec Secretary Clinton said, we must use smart power, namely the full range of tools at our disposal, including <coughs> defense, diplomacy, development, respect for law, human rights, and public-private partnerships. Now, I would argue that this paradigm is in contrast to a different one. Unilateralism, not engagement. Black hole, not translation. Going it alone, not leverage. And I would argue two things. First, however imperfect this is in implementation in any particular case, it is a superior approach. It's a superior strategy for the 21st century. Second, that any country that lacks hegemonic power, and that includes not just the United States, but Germany, would be wise to adopt the same approach, because it's the only one that gives a capacity for leadership. Leadership through legitimacy, leadership around values. Now, the United States was in an unusual posture because there had been systematic 
disengagement from international institutions, and indeed our Congress is very hostile to these international engagements. And so uh, the first term of the Obama administration was characterized by efforts to get treaties with regard to the START Treaty, mutual legal assistance treaties, bilateral investment treaties, defense trade treaties, private international law treaties, a few free trade agreements, with continuing but unsuccessful efforts thus far on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Disabilities Convention, the Women's Rights Convention, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the Framework Treaty on Tobacco Control. But one area in which uh, we made uh, important contributions unnoticed, essentially unnoticed, is the whole zone of nominations to international <coughs> legal bodies. To the International Court of Justice, we nominated Joan Donahue to the Human Rights uh, Committee of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Gerald Newman of Harvard Law School, on the Race Discrimination Convention, Carlos Vasquez of Georgetown, to the International Law Commission, Sean Murphy of George Washington Law School, Mechanism for the International Criminal Tribunals, Ted Moran. We did this for a simple reason. We knew that even after I was gone and even after Hillary Clinton was gone, these people would still be there and they would still be engaging. And that is what they are doing. <coughs> Second, we tried to <coughs> engage with the human rights <coughs> bodies. Uh, the last administration had boycotted the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, we ran and were elected. We just ran and were re-elected. We conducted the first universal periodic review. Uh, we supported special rapporteurs on a number of issues, working groups on important issues, commissions of inquiry on human rights situations in Syria and Libya. The Syria report was noted today. Used the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva as the forum for addressing the difficult balance between religious intolerance and freedom of expression in what became a landmark resolution, Re resolution 1618. On international criminal justice, some say the U.S. position on the international criminal justice has not changed. I say it's changed 180 degrees. But guess what? No laws were changed in the making of this film. <laughs> How did this happen? The United States had supported international criminal justice at Nuremberg and Tokyo, and then through a series of twists and turns, had come to the position where it was supporting international criminal justice at all of the ad hoc tribunals, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Cambodia, Sierra Leone. But we were, our official policy under the Bush administration was to defeat and eliminate the International Criminal Court, which was going to become the standing international criminal law institution. It requires 67 votes to ratify the Rome Statute, and we are well shy of that. And so the question was, how could we align the policies without changing the laws? This was a task that, to me, was akin to something I did once and only once in my life, turn a car around in a garage with the doors closed. <laughs> and it involved engage, translate, and leverage. The United States had never attended a meeting of the ICC. We went to Kampala, we went to The Hague, we went to New York. We translated. In other words, instead of saying we were opposed to uh, the object and purpose of the treaty, which is what John Bolton had done in the famous unsigning, we said the opposite. And then instead of saying we're opposed to every case before the court, we said we are supporting them all. The United States is supporting every ongoing prosecution at the International Criminal Court, so the policy is 180 degrees different through a policy of engage, translate, and leverage. Or how about partnerships? We decided that you cannot simply attack <coughs> this problem with public resources. You need to develop partnerships with private entities like those who helped to build this academy. That multi-stakeholder initiatives were the way to go. The Kimberley process attacked conflict diamonds. Uh, the voluntary principles for extractives raised the standard for conduct of contractors who are working to extract oil and uh, gas and other kinds of natural resources. Public-private initiatives were the way to go on internet governance. And so Secretary Clinton specifically called for engagement with private entities as well as development work and uh, the function of AID in the quadrennial development and, and, di and diplomacy review to create a new set of partners 
with whom actions could be leveraged. If this was the predicate for action, then how was this applied in these seven critical areas of our foreign policy? And I'll start with human rights, and I'll end up at 21st century war, and I'll end up at drones. Why do I do this? Because if I don't do this, I start at drones, and then that's all I'm ever asked about. <laughs> that's what this speech is about, putting drones in context. Drones took up about a fifth of my time, and from the perspective of virtually everybody I talk to about my time in the government, it's 100% of what I'm asked. And it's from people who do not understand the strategy that we were trying to pursue. So let me start with perhaps the most simple example, human rights. The rights of lesbian, gays, uh, bisexuals, and transgendered individuals. Hillary Clinton ha had a choice. She could simply not address this issue, non-engagement. Instead, having opened the forum, the Human Rights Council, she went there, and on uh, the anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, she gave a speech there on this subject. What did she say? LGBT rights are human rights. It is a pure translation exercise. She said, those of you who thought that human rights had a content, the content includes protecting the rights of these individuals who previously many excluded from the protections of that regime. And it was not new to her because 15 years earlier at Beijing, she had said women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights, a pure translation exercise. And then using the leverage that we got from this to combine with various domestic initiatives, for example, eliminating don't ask, don't tell for our military, uh, 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 giving same-sex benefits throughout the federal government, now taking a position at the US Supreme Court in favor of marriage equality and against the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, and we suddenly have a policy in which this administration supported LGBT rights through smart power. Or take this one. By the way, th th this will have a repetitive quality because every single example is this one. But I just want to show you that this is what was driving what we are doing. And I hope that after this is over, everyone will talk more about the strategy than about the tactics or the micro tactics or the tool that bothers them today. Chen Guangchen was the leading human rights dissident of Beijing. He's blind. He escaped from house arrest. He was on the outskirts of Beijing. He asked to come into our embassy. The non-engagement possibility was to say, go away. Um, we have a lot of issues with China. Uh, we don't really need to add to this. Our approach was the opposite, engage with Chen and engage with China. Secretary Clinton gave us one directive, his wishes are values, very simple. She called us, I was there in China at the time, his wishes are values. And then one question that arose for a lawyer is, how do you admit Chen to the embassy and not then admit every other Chinese dissident in a very large country. Remembering that Fang Li Zhe had entered the embassy after Tiananmen Square and been there for 16 months, that uh, Cardinal Minzenti went into the US embassy in Hungary for 17 years. Those of you who know Julian Assange has been in the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK now for nearly a year. And my suggestion was that we translate that the interpretive move was to say not that he had a right of diplomatic asylum, but that the United States had a right to admit him for temporary medical care, which distinguished the case from others. And then to leverage that decision, you're a lawyer, <laughs> think of another case to which that applies. Not many. <laughs> and then, um, it was very clear that the private resources would be critical. And it turned out that NYU had a campus both in Shanghai and also in New York. We initially uh, made an arrangement to move him to Shanghai. Um, uh, he then asked for a different outcome. We moved him to New York and here I am, uh, the day after my son's college graduation, meeting him. Um, at his new and very nice apartment in uh, Washington Square Village, New York. 
take uh, Burma, Aung San Suu Kyi. Again, instead of non-engagement, we engage with both the Burmese regime and with Aung San Suu Kyi. Previously, there had been a entry strategy for sanctions in which they had been gradually increased over nearly 30 years. We translated that into an action for action strategy to deconstruct those sanctions with the goal of trying to leverage the greater freedom into uh, an approach toward rule of law and human rights that could in include private entities. And indeed, <coughs> German NGOs are now involved. Aung San Suu Kyi is now the chair of the Parliamentary Committee of Rule of Law in Burma. And then perhaps the most uh, dramatic change and in fact most complicated change, uh, Arab awakening, which as you see from the bottom, cut across any number of countries in the region. And amid all of the confusion, Secretary Clinton said one thing which I remember very distinctly. She said, you know, most of those people do not want to join Al-Qaeda. What they want to do instead is assert freedom in countries where they've previously been subject to autocratic control. Case study number one, Libya. And here is a cartoon that I got from the wall at the University of Tripoli, previously Gaddafi University. And those of you who are professors would have been amazed that in the center of the campus are gallows, where students who had been hung in protest used to hang for days as an example to other students. Now, many people understand the Libya uh, policy as a hard power policy, the use of NATO force and the use of US force. It was a smart power policy in which we leveraged a no-fly zone and an arms embargo with an assets freeze, diplomacy, a travel ban, accountability at the ICC for a limited purpose, namely protecting civilians, where instead of calling it an example of international responsibility to protect, we focused on the fact that Qaddafi had forfeited his responsibility to protect, creating a vacuum into which other countries could step with sufficient consensus, and then we engage with the Libyans themselves, the Arab League, the UN Security Council with two resolutions, and NATO to achieve this particular outcome. Syria obviously has been a greater challenge, principally because neither the Chinese nor the Russians will abstain, as opposed to veto a Security Council resolution. Nevertheless, Secretary Kerry has made this a prime concern of his, now engaging both with Lavrov the Russian Foreign Minister, Brahimi, the UN Special Representative. Uh, there's been engagement across the board with the opposition, the Human Rights Council, an effort to translate the Libya precedent to the Syria situation, and the goal to, at least with limited steps, <coughs> achieve a ceasefire, support for the opposition, provision of humanitarian aid, the securing of chemical weapons and accountability. This has not been successful thus far, I will be the first to admit. But this is the approach. Um, if the alternative is unilateralism, we've seen where that goes. Take, for example, global warming and consider this phenomenon. Um, because of fossil fuels, the ice cap is melting. Because the ice cap is melting, you can sail further into the Arctic and if you look down, you see the outer continental shelf. And if you can extract from it, you will extract more fossil fuels. The question is, what is the governance mechanism to determine whether this is the way it ought to go? And the answer, again, was engage, translate, and leverage. The Kyoto Protocol was uh, abandoned, <coughs> but we engaged at Copenhagen. The deal was about to fall apart. Secretary Clinton and President Obama famously secured a politically binding agreement on a temperature goal with a role for developed and developing nations. At Durban, they followed, translating a rule. They could not reach a agreed language, and then my lawyer came up with this word, agreed outcome with legal force. They rejected legally binding, and they accepted agreed <coughs> outcome with legal force. They selected then, as the governance regime, the Arctic Council, which has eight members, and have made that the governance mechanism of choice, including now many observers, including China, 
to create a regime of layered cooperation where non-legal understandings are placed on top of a legal backdrop of law of the sea. Take the South China Sea, which is currently the scene of enormous gunboat diplomacy, to be blunt, by the Chinese government vis-a-vis -vis the Filipinos, the Malaysians, uh, the Singaporeans, Brunei. Uh, and uh, they would prefer to keep this in a zone of unilateralism, black hole, and going it alone. The response now being generated through a series of collective actions engagement, the first use of peaceful dispute resolution under the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea brought by the Philippines, uh, translation, how to law of the sea principles regarding rocks and islands suggest maritime entitlements, and then how to leverage the rules that emerge into a regional solution that can be administered by the ASEAN Code of Conduct. How about, the only thing that changes is not just technology, what about the EU? Um, the changing EU environment. I announced early on my desire to engage with my counterparts. I went to a meeting in Brussels, there were this many people in the room. I said, which of you is my counterpart? And every one of them raised their hand. <laughs> I, I kid you not. Uh, the lawyer for each foreign ministry, the lawyers for the European Commission, the European Council, the Parliament, the External Action Service. So even the process of engaging with your legal counterparts requires you to try to reach consensus with literally dozens of people. Then translate is the European Union a foreign state for purposes of Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, the famous Cadi case. Under what circumstances does EU law trump UN law? And then to what extent can you use European jurisprudence to influence U.S. constitutional jurisprudence on the same issue. We had done this in the Lawrence case, which banned same-sex uh, criminalization of same-sex sodomy in the United States. We tried to do it again with regard to the Perry case involving same-sex marriage. I related to some of you yesterday how the State Department tried to build bridges between the U.S. Supreme Court and the European <laughs> Courts of Justice and Human Rights as a way of pursuing this leverage. Or take uh, assisted reproductive <coughs> technologies. Take this scenario, a lesbian woman who is an American citizen is married or partnered with an Australian woman in Australia. And uh, the question is, when can a child born of that relationship uh, confer upon the child American citizenship because of the nationality of the mother. U.S. immigration laws say there must be a natural relationship between the mother and the child to uh, have the mother confer U.S. citizenship on the child in Australia. Um, after a very lengthy internal bureaucratic battle, we translated the word natural to mean genetic and gestational not just genetic. <laughs> it does not seem dramatic. And by the way, it seems to me a pretty good translation, <laughs> but it remains highly contested, which has led me to what I think will be the subject of my academic research for many years to come. Well, what about the human rights of clones? Maybe one of you is a clone. I don't know. <laughs> People laugh, but there are clones among us, and there will be in 10 years. And the question is, will they be treated as lesser beings because of the state of their birth as uh, uh, illegitimates were, as people of different sexual orientations, as people with disabilities are? Will it be that someone who is born in a test tube is considered a lesser person, not entitled to the human rights of someone <coughs> born human? Are they subject to the full protection of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or will we translate those protections to them? I think this is a problem we all need to think about before the clones are all here, because I think they are here. And uh, let's take cyberspace, the last frontier, clearly the area that nobody thought of when the traditional territorial rules of international law were written. Four critical faces for our purposes where values are deeply in conflict, internet freedom, intellectual property, e-commerce, Cyber conflict. Secretary Clinton 
pointed out in one of her first speeches on this. And if you go back and Google Secretary Clinton put in smart power and, you will find speeches on smart power and the internet, smart power and uh, stage 21st century statecraft, smart power and private-public partnerships. There are at least 20 speeches laying out this framework. One of the first things she pointed out in 2010 was that Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights anticipates technological developments will allow people to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media, and made it clear that interference with those is a violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But take, for example, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, which was, as you know, abandoned here in Europe and finally abandoned in the United States. How do you st establish international standards to protect intellectual property? My children were the ones who told me about SOPA, PIPA, and ACTA, because the generation online knew all about this when most of the others of us didn't. Or what about the fact that the electronic marketplace may lead to electronic dispute resolution? How do you create a mechanism that will foster growth, create, create markets, build trust, and also protect consumers? And what about cyber conflict? This is the classic area where there has been no, some, particularly Chinese, have argued that there is a black hole. And the United States and Germans and the Dutch and the Brits have tried instead to create forums to translate the laws of war, make clear it's not a law-free zone, to leverage into standard-setting exercises. Or the fact that most 21st century war will be fought by private security contractors Again, something we tried to engage through something called the Montreux document, translate into an international code of conduct, binding public and private entities alike, and leverage into behavior through private contracts. This brings me to drones. And I would say drones are part of a broader smart power approach. That was made explicit by President Obama last week. Drones are a tool, they are not a strategy. For people to discuss drones, as the issue is like discussing bullets as the issue or guided missiles as the issue. These are not per se illegal. Whether they're legal or illegal depends on whether they're applied consistently with the laws of war. If you fixate on the technology of drones, 10 years from now, conflict will be done by cyber commands and you'll be focusing on the issue of yesterday. The solution, said President Obama finally in the speech last week, is we should engage with our allies, translate legal rules to the new setting, and leverage combining limited uses of force with diplomacy development and cooperative law enforcement. People think this was new. He simply echoed what Secretary Clinton said 10 years after 9-11, that in the long run we should use force for limited and defined purposes to challenge Al-Qaeda's ideology, but in the short term, there is no alternative to precise and persistent force to degrade Al-Qaeda. Again, it's a uh, difference between the last administration's approach. And last week, uh, and I'm delighted because it was after I gave a speech on a similar subject at Oxford, President Obama basically said, this is not a global war on terror, the threat has evolved, it's an effort to dismantle specific terrorist networks, that drones are not inherently good or bad. They are an effective tool that is discriminate. <coughs> Could be the least bad way to conduct just war as long as you do so as part of a smart approach. He said we must define the struggle or it will define us. And most important, we cannot have a perpetual war. We must end this war. So for those who tell you that the approach is the same, I would say this. The Obama administration has never used the term ever global war on terror, and it has never ever used a black hole approach. It has never ever endorsed inhumane treatment, and it has never applied a label as opposed to fact-based approach. The issues going forward are transparency, consultation, standard setting, and ending war. Here are steps that President Obama announced to discipline drones, transparency, consultation, and standard setting. Here are elements of his guidance that he signed raising the standard for striking targets, requiring near certainty of identity and no civilian casualties, and shifting the responsibility for drones to the Pentagon from the CIA. 
Most important, making clear that the enemy is limited, that we are not at war with ideas, religions, or everyone who hates America, that self-radicalizers like those in Boston and Woolwich who don't join Al-Qaeda are not subject to the laws of war but to law enforcement. And here's the most important thing. It's part of a bigger strategy, ending not one war but three wars. Iraq, Afghanistan, and Al-Qaeda through declining military engagement, continued civilian engagement, developing civil society, and enhanced diplomatic engagement going forward. In this scenario, closing Guantanamo, the key point that President Obama made, lost, and I saw mentioned nowhere here is, if this war is over, they have no legal authority to hold these people on Guantanamo, and they must be released. And here are specific steps that he announced to do that. Now, there are multiple challenges going forward. Will there be a new authorization of force? What is self-defense called for? How do you know that the sovereign has consented? What about independent review? Is it really possible to make peace with the Taliban? What do you do with self-radicalizers? But I want to make this point. This is what 21st century international lawyering looks like. It's not Grotius's international law. It means engaging around our values, new lawmaking tools, translating the 21st century laws to the 21st century realities, and leveraging law as a tool of smart power. Which brings me to the close, Lloyd Cutler, who was a smart lawyer who believed in smart power. I saw two very famous incidents when I was a young lawyer. Nicaragua had sued the United States at the International Court of Justice in the Reagan administration. And there was a special meeting of the American Society of International Law. I was in the US government. Government lawyers were on one side, literally a howling group of individuals on the other side. Uh, it was like a prize fight, people screaming back and forth at each other. And then they brought in Lloyd Cutler, and he said, I don't agree with what this administration has done, but this is the United States, my country, which is in some difficulty, and what is at stake is the development of an orderly system of the rule of law, and we must look to a long-term solution. And the less partisanship and the less adversariness and the less posturing, the better. There's a room t filled with twice as many people as are here, and suddenly it was as if the grown-up had entered the room. Or when they had the choice, stay forever in cold conflict with uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Iranians, or engage with them at the Algiers Accord, create a new lawmaking tool, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, create a fund, a billion dollars, promote international arbitration through dispute settlement mechanisms, that continues 30 years later, slowly, but has fostered a whole new body of international jurisprudence. That is engaging, translating, and leverage. It was a smart lawyer seeing smart power as a solution for the next century. And so I think that is, uh, if people ask, that is the Obama-Clinton doctrine. It's one I think is correct, and I also think it's one that the government of Germany should seek to uh, apply as part of its own leadership role in this globalizing society. Thank you. Harold, thank you so much uh, for this speech and uh, thank you in particular that you uh, gave it in a very personal way. Uh, when you mentioned in the beginning and again toward the end of your speech uh, this difficulty that uh, we have to deal with 21st century challenges and 20th century law, uh, an American peculiarity in constitutional law came to my mind. The difference between those who say that the American Constitution, 227 years old, has to be interpreted strictly in the way it was understood by the founders and the others who say a constitution is sort of a living tree and you have to find answers that are uh, suitable for the present. Is something uh, parallel, does something parallel exist in international law? 
Is there this difference in interpretation theory as it is in constitutional law? Um, explicitly no, but in fact, yes. And um, so, um, again, I, I think the, the key is to what extent does a set of laws that was developed for an age of nation states uh, who conduct conflicts in very clearly defined arenas bounded by territory give you all the rules necessary to deal with the modern situation. And the more that I've thought about it, um, I think the real question is, in the 21st century, what is the use of force as a part of a package of tools? Richard Holbrook, who helped found this institution, believed that diplomacy backed by force was the most effective form of diplomacy. He did not believe that force is the answer, but he thought that force was part of the answer. That's a smart power approach. In Kosovo, which I was actively involved in, there was a point at which the conclusion was the human rights equation was more protected by a limited use of force multilaterally, even if without the approval of the Russians. And that if this could be brought within certain normative frames of a kind of just war theory, that this could be an advancement in the development of international law. Old international law, or the classical international law, said no use of force except with Security Council approval or in self-defense. And humanitarian intervention was of a much more narrow and limited nature. So I do believe that um, as, as I've gone out, th those who are pacifists or who believe that any use of force is always wrong are not going to believe, believe me. But those who believe that there are sometimes when tools are applied to try to solve a problem, I mean, nobody thinks in Kosovo the West had territorial ambitions. It was not aggression. Uh, nobody thought that the NATO forces who set up a no-fly zone in Libya were trying to occupy Libya. Uh, the question is, was that consistent with the rules of law, and was that more friendly to human rights than doing nothing? And I think this is going to be a central challenge for international lawyers, particularly as conduct becomes less and less clearly linked to territory. Um, I don't know where much cyber conflict occurs in the cloud. I don't even know where the cloud is. <laughs> but principles of sovereignty attached to territory, attached to rigid rules, invites twisting categories to achieve outcomes, where a good faith effort to translate should lead to a good faith effort to, chal to tra challenge that translation. But both of these are efforts to apply the spirit of the laws. Okay. So the tennis court is open. You can return the ball. Attack or return with first Herr Nolte. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm an international lawyer too, and uh, I admire your role as a legal advisor and also as a thinker in in our profession. That is why I uh, will ask a critical question, um, and it will not relate to drones. Um, I'm very much in favor of translation. But the question is, who translates? And I like Obama's and Co's translations. But if we talk about international law, it will be the law for all of us. And the acceptance of the translation is, is important. So my question is, is your approach not, in a sense, defining a way conflicts of interests about international law? I'm sure that the Chinese leadership shares the approach that they should approach, have a smart power approach where they translate uh, international law to the needs of the 21st century. And I would not be surprised if they came to different conclusions. So are we not just translating 
the problems to a different level and not solving them by calling it small, uh, smart, smart power approach. So uh, as a lawyer, I'm a bit concerned that the value of, of form and procedure uh, is undervalued by uh, and, and, and the agreement among the relevant parties. In a, in a sense, it may be interpreted as a form of uh, uh, thinking international law under American hegemony. I, I, I would love the world to be that way and under a an, an benign Obama American hegemony, but is that really sufficient? Thank you. So Professor Nolte is a great international legal scholar. Um, but what I would, I would um, disagree respectfully on three points. Num number one, um, all, all big powers don't translate. The Chinese are not claiming that the South China Sea is a law-governed space. They simply say, we have a right to everything in the South China Sea. And then if you ask them, what is your legal interpretation, they come up with something called a nine-dash line. This is reminiscent to me of something the Americans used to call a Monroe Doctrine. It's not a legal doctrine, it's a, a doctrine of political authority. Once you bring them into a law-governed space where they're litigating these issues under the Law of the Sea Convention and under the Law of Sea Rules, their freedom to twist those rules for their own purposes uh, is limited. So my view is bringing people into a translation space where they're debating the translation is critical. Number two, translation requires transparency. The United States legal theory cannot be tested by smart international lawyers from Europe unless people know what the theory is. Which is why in March 2010 I set forth our legal theory to the extent to which I was permitted to do so to really invite debate on the subject. There's a strange tendency in the US government, which is don't tell anybody what our legal theory is, because if people start to set limits, then some future case we're constrained. So we're much better off that nobody even knows what our legal theory is than to know what the limits of our <laughs> professed legal theory is. My view is the opposite. If we're going to do this practice, then we ought to do it within the rules that we set for ourselves. Defining those rules beforehand is better than defining them when we're being sued. Which means that I think the greatest failure of the Obama administration over the last few months was lack of transparency, which is why President Obama's decision to reverse that and acknowledge and then try to justify actions going forward according to transparent standards is the opening to consultation and standard setting. The third difference is um, maybe it's bad that the United States defines legal rules, but frankly the United States has led the movement to define most legal rules in our lifetime, good and bad. And some of those rules I think have been made better and stronger by the participation of our most thoughtful allies. And I think that is the case here, too. You know, when President Obama comes to Berlin in two weeks, I'm sure that Chancellor Merkel will do what allies do. Congratulations for giving your speech. Now let's see you deliver. We want to push you on these issues. I'm getting criticized about X or Y. And uh, what exactly is the process for making this genuinely multilateral as opposed to unilateral? So if you want to engage, engage. If you want to translate, let's agree on the translation. Because if partners disagree on the correct translation, there'll be a dispute. And we don't want to have disputes over things on which we agree in principle. So I think you know many hegemons like China do not bring things to a legal process. The, the Chinese government would not acknowledge that cyberspace is governed by international law. They called it a black hole. And I think we are in a vastly better position. So being in a better position is not being at the place you want to be at the end. But it's an improvement. And as you know, Paul McCartney say, we need a little help from our friends.
Good evening. I'm Mr. Nana. I'm from the German Con Foreign Council uh, Institute. Um, I would like to know, did you think uh, that the um, doctrine, what you have uh, shown us here and explained, would be in a same by uh, um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Clinton in her view when he had more um, responsibility to for the foreign policy to uh, to have the decision and uh, for example if she would be the president it would be the same uh, doctrine and the same policy what she ha uh, would have done in the uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, policy and in her administration for example and the uh, second point is did you think uh, that she has now realized that in Afghanistan is not only the strong power what when she has uh, when she had uh, yes, said yes for the Ad Afghanistan uh, uh, attack in 2003 and uh, that uh, would be better to have a uh, smart power what uh, she declare now thank you so there are two parts of that first uh, secretary clinton i think believes in engage translate and leverage as a philosophy of action from the time she was a um, a student which is you know her instinct is to be collaborative and have these conversations in talking to these dialogue partners, figuring out a common value, which sometimes means some principle of right that forms the basis of their alliance, and then recognizing that governments can't do everything, so their private parties and private money need to be a part of it, and then leveraging this into a result. So Hillary Clinton is not a, in the words of the Tea Party, a socialist. <laughs> she is a free market personality, but she believes in entrepreneurship, et cetera. On Afghanistan, um, and I said this in my speech at Oxford, if seven days after September 11th, Al Gore were president, and he did win the popular vote, and he came out and said to the world, we have just had a devastating attack, 3,000 of our citizens were killed in a gross human rights violation. Our Congress has just declared war on about 3,000 people who are part of a group called Al-Qaeda. We think we need to take from the battlefield 200 or fewer leaders of that and win a new kind of war. And then he said, here are some things I will not do. I will not do, I will not invade Iraq. I will not torture anyone. I will not open Guantanamo. I will not do military commissions. I will not do extraordinary renditions. Those are stupid. And that will diminish our smart power. Here's what I will do. With regard to most of the Muslim people, I will appear, appeal to their ideology and try to get them on our side. And then there will be a group of people who are irredeemable because they have no interest in political position. And with regard to those people, I will use whatever technological method is available to me, including drones, to eliminate that threat. And I will do it consistent with the law, I will do it fully transparently, and I will consult our allies, and I will consult the democratic process. And I hope it's over in six months. I think that most of the world would have said, that's the way to go. So the mistake was, instead of doing that, all of these misadventures were followed. And then the second mistake was that President Obama, in coming in, didn't quickly reverse that situation. He vowed to, but that he was not successful. And then they began to blur together. Everybody lost patience, and everybody is sick of war. And now, a week ago, President Obama said, I'm sick of war myself, and this war is going to end. I'm going to go back to the original strategy, better late than never. And I think my view is um, our German friends have a choice. You could say, we won't get fooled again, and we're going to be very skeptical. Or you could say, 
this is your last best chance to get this done. So please try. Now, will Afghanistan be, you know, a Madisonian democracy? No. But is it better off now than it was when everyone was illiterate, when women were being um, subordinated, where there was no internet, where there was no uh, economic growth? It's a different scenario. So the, the question is how to build on what has been accomplished. I've already quite a list uh, of people who would like to speak. How much time do we have, Gary? We'll Quarter past we'll nine or so? Okay, okay. Don't so, worry, we're sleeping here. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw a hand over here, a lady there. Yeah, please, you. Thank you. Um, Katharina Berner, Humboldt University, Berlin. First of all, thank you very much for your not only very instructive, but also very entertaining lecture, admittedly. I have got a question concerning the first pillar of your strategy, which is um, engagement. Maybe I missed something, but well, I wonder whether I missed something. You spoke of various forms of what I would call active engagement. That is influencing conduct by other actors in international law. What I missed was a kind of passive engagement, which is, for example, judicial, judicial review of um, well, acts of the United States. You, for example, touched upon the, the Human Rights Committee. Um, are there any plans, for example, to accept the individual communications procedure or similar mechanisms like that, which are, well, not active, but simply passive, but which can also enhance legitimacy and which German international lawyers might consider, well, worthwhile considering for a strategy. So I, I don't know the answer to that specific question, but um, on subjecting ourselves to external review, the United States not only, when it joined the Human Rights Council, it knew it would have to do a universal periodic review and subject its entire conduct to examination by the Human Rights Council. And um, we presented the most detailed report given to the Human Rights Council. And I appeared and defended uh, our report uh, over two or three days. And I think many of the people at the Human Rights Council said that this is a model of transparency. Um, I personally, I'll be honest, I do not personally believe that the individual communication process of the ICCPR has proven to be a particularly effective method of raising these issues. Reasonable minds can disagree on this point. That would require a ratification of a separate protocol. Um, and the United States government hasn't gotten to that point yet. I don't think it will as a political matter for some time. Um, but I will say this. Um, th there are many, many issues, and I'm sure everybody here could point to something where the U.S. engagement has been less than satisfactory to them on that the issue they care about the most. But that doesn't mean that the overall strategy is not one of engagement. I mean, we're at the Human Rights Council. We're at the International Criminal Court. We are invoking accountability. We're referring cases. That is a very different mood than existed only five years ago. Waldo Fassbinder. In one of your first slides, you talked about the uh, hostile environment in which you have been working for uh, quite some time. Hostile environment in uh, terms of the uh, stance taken by large parts of the American public towards international law, which is uh, in a great part of the population apparently regarded as something foreign still, as something uh, which must be uh, contained in order to foster American interests. Do you expect uh, any, any change of that situation? Because I, I believe as long as the American public and also uh, 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 the, the, the important parts of Congress are taking that position, uh, a lot of this translation will be very difficult in the end. So how can one change this, this view of, of parts of the American public towards international law and, and what it means to, 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 to American interests? Um, 
I, I think the primary antidote is education and global exchange. Um, you know, I, I, that's why I returned to the academy, in that um, if I can teach students to think about this differently than you thought about in the Cold War, that's an important change. For example, many Americans see international law as a straitjacket. Their entire fixation is on the way it constrains our authority. Um, my view is <laughs> I flew to Germany protected by the Warsaw Convention. I withdrew money from an ATM machine uh, rather than carrying traveler's checks because of the SWIFT agreement. Uh, I entered without a visa under Schengen. I have been freed to lead a life of global travel that dwarfs what I experienced as a young person. And it's all because of the facilitating power of international law. And <laughs> here's one of the great ironies. The people who are most opposed to us entering the law of the sea treaty in the name of sovereignty thereby surrender the Arctic to the Russians and the South China Sea to the Chinese, who are the people they fear the most, in the name of sovereignty. Now, this has to be addressed, I think, at um, a grassroots level. John Kornblum, who's here, uh, reminded me that when every diplomat of the United States that I've ever met, without regard to their political affiliation, is opposed to the death penalty, because they live in countries where they see how people are opposed to the death penalty. And they don't understand why if all of these countries have foregone this punishment as a tool of state policy, the United States cannot. Um, so I think that um, um, a lot of it is breaking uh, individuals out of uh, their insularity. It calls for NGO activity, like the American Academy of Berlin. <laughs> and frankly, I see that's what is the function of the programs that are established here. You know, just mutual dialogue and explanation. I, I do believe that this will change over time, Bardo. I, uh, uh, it will be slow. I think maybe the last to change will be 67 votes in our Senate, <laughs> <laughs> which is too bad. <coughs> um, but. Um, I think it will change over time. The gentleman in the very last row. Mm. Mm. The human rights issue, I think the support of the United States uh, of the resolution giving the same rights to uh, gay people in the world is one of the great issues your administration did because the Bush administration joined with the Holy mm -hmm. Seat and the Islamic States. So I think this is a great, great difference in human rights policy. And the other question, uh, or the question I have, I remember very well the New Haven approach uh, with McDougall, and I think I also learned something about it uh, with you in my former times. Uh, is your policy now a development of this New Haven approach? I always understood that those who have the power define also uh, international law in certain cases. And I always thought this is open to a great uh, uh, possibility of abuse. But now I learn this. Uh, that if you have uh, a subtle approach to all this and the different uh, um, possibilities, uh, then uh, this possibility of abuse is minimized. So my question is, is this uh, your policy now, or the theoretical approach, is this a new form of the former uh, New Haven approach? Well, in a way, that's the same question that Dieter asked, in that um, those who take a highly scientific view of international law act as if these are totally precise, noble, immutable rules, and that 
how they apply to particular situations is predetermined. What the New Haven School is, is highly jargon laden, but the basic notion is, is world government will not be achieved, but what is possible is a public order of the world community in which rules of law are designed to promote certain human values, among them dignity, uh, security, equality, etc. This was accused and criticized often in Europe of being overly malleable or flexible or responsive to the policy interests of the United States. And there is some middle ground, it seems to me, between the need for objective rules by which national conduct can be measured and the awareness that national conduct can change rules um, and that law ought to be in service of particular kinds of human values. So I actually think that the example you gave of human rights of LGBTs uh, is a good example. Um, I think it's pretty clear that in 1948 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they were not speaking openly about the rights of LGBT people. And so the translation exercise is a critically important one to bring this now previously invisible group within the framework of human rights protections. Hopefully, take note. A mere lawyer, but also a board member of the German Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, thank you very much for a very cohesive interpretation of the last years of uh, Secretary Hil uh, Hillary Clinton's policy. Uh, I was intrigued, uh, you mentioned twice, or you alluded twice in your speech, that Germany should adopt this approach of engage, translate, and leverage. And I was wondering, it sounded like you had something special in mind. Was this you talking about the current news about drones, or does it have a more general uh, implication you would like to comment on? Um, by the way, I, I think that the German, the Germans are already <laughs> adopting this approach, and that that's one of the uh, formula for the leadership of Germany. So, I mean, Germany is not on the Security Council. Um, Germany has restrictions on use of military force. Um, its primary instruments are smart power tools, um, you know, intellectual leadership, economic uh, advantages, the power of its civil society. So, when I go to an international forum, the UN or anywhere else, the Germans are extraordinarily active. They're engaged with everybody. If you talk to them about what legal rules are, they listen to one interpretation, express their own, and very often there's an effort to try to figure out who has a better translation. And an organization like this one is the result of leverage of an idea that was generated by some government and former governmental officials with private parties to achieve a a very important NGO that has both educational missions and the like. So I, I think when I, I say that in any world in which no country can dominate things and tell people what to do with its hard power, smart power will be the best way to maximize, lead through your values. Now I don't think drones are excluded from this. If, if the German government doesn't like the way Obama's handling drones, they should tell them <laughs> that's engagement. They don't like his translation, and they don't agree with the, the words of the speech. They should say, here's what we think is the traditional rules of armed conflict and why we don't think it fits there. Um, and I think if the view of the German government is that the United States needs to be pushed into a different situation, there are many ways they can collaborate with media, academic voices, and others to leverage their voice. So um, I happen to think that what I'm saying is as much a description of what uh, you know, the, the, the German legal community is already doing um, as, as it is a, a normative exhortation to do more. Mm -hmm. And Tom um, I agree with you with your fundamental concepts of uh, uh, in particular engagement and translation, implementation, leverage. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, I think in Germany many people think that international law is self-executing. It is not. It, it needs being pushed. It needs uh, leadership. Uh, and uh, many times the U.S. really exercises leadership. But what we don't like is hegemony, you know, and, and therefore then we move to the level, the normative level. International law is a system of reciprocity, I think. And uh, when you have a rule, you have to accept that the same rule which you apply uh, should be applied to you as well. And I think that is really the test, you know, in, in, in many, uh, on many issues. Uh, uh, it's not possible to have a system of international law where each actor determines for itself what is good, what is just. You know. We need some common system of values and rules at the same time. And therefore, I think this aspect of reciprocity to me is extremely important. You know, you, uh, uh, for instance, uh, those drones, you know, it has, the issue has been touched upon just a minute ago. Uh, they, the drones, where do they fly? I hope they will never fly over Germany, no, and and uh, it's uh, and uh, over Washington now. Some Chinese drones over over Washington. That's you no, know, that's of course hypothetical test, but it is the test, uh, the test of reciprocity. What what we claim, what we consider to be just, we have to accept it also on the part of others, and uh, therefore we have to be very cautious. You know, when we go too far, this can bounce back to our detriment. So, you know, Christian Tomasad is a great uh, hero of international law and, and of mine personally. I agree with the first part of what you said, particularly your notion that you, international law is not self-executing. At, at dinner, Christian said to me, you have to fight for law. And I thought I never heard a stronger articulation. You know, when when the question is, will a good or bad rule of law emerge from a particular situation, that to me is like asking, if someone has a cancer, will they live or die? A lot depends on how able and committed are the lawyers who attack the problem. It's a matter of craft more than it is a matter of, of a deterministic model. On the reciprocity point, Christian, I think that's what drove Obama to give his speech. But, but notice the uh, catch-22 for Obama. If he says nothing, which by the way was the easier thing for him to do, um, people will be upset, but on the other hand they know that he, they prefer him to some of the alternatives. If he tries to define the standards, people will disagree with the way he defined it. But what I thought was important was that Obama said if we do not define the struggle, it will define us. He could have said, if I don't define this issue, it will define me as president. In other words, he inherited this whole situation as a legacy. He fought to change it, did not succeed. Now he's being defined as like his predecessor. And he was saying, even before I've made the change, I'm going to redefine this. And I think he said something important, which is, he said, I think drones are legal and necessary. Legal, because under the way I've translated the law, it, it's a, an appropriate way to tackle a problem. He even said it's the least human rights violative way to do so. It's better than the alternatives, and people who don't like this should suggest an alternative. And it's necessary if we're going to end a particular conflict which has been going on for 12 years. And for those who say it's illegal, unnecessary, or that there's a better alternative, they should put forward their theory and see in the public debate who's better. So uh, I think Obama had a difficulty. If he had said nothing, um, you know, it looks like he's trying to use darkness to cloud his activities. If he makes a statement, it looks like the hegemon is trying to define the laws their way. But frankly, I think what he did was to open the debate about an issue that was virtually closed. The most important thing about Obama's speech is that he made it. <laughs> this issue was on the back burner. <coughs> most people had thought he was going to let it go. He was going to tackle something else, you know, immigration. Instead, he chose to go back and say, that's not who we are, and that's not who I am. 
On the other hand, I'm not going to say that what I've been doing is illegal, wrong, or in violation of human rights. I just need to own it. A final point. This was the longest speech of Obama's presidency except his State of the Union message. And until he gave it, Obama had never acknowledged ordering a drone attack. The only targeted killing he acknowledged is the death of Osama bin Laden. So he took personal responsibility and owned a tool as part of a strategy. And I thought it was very important. He said, will we respond to this situation with this aberrational approach and let it go forever? Or will we shift to a more balanced, sustainable approach for the long term in which Guantanamo is not one of the tools and which drones will be part of the tools but in a much more constrained focus. And he said, I opt for the latter. And I think that was uh, courageous and, and um, a tremendously important intellectual move. I mean, the former, I don't think most German people could accept. The latter, you're in a wait and see mode. <laughs> I have three more questions, and I think uh, with these I close the list. There was one hand to my left over there. Yes, please. Um, please forgive me for asking you about a more specific issue you mentioned, but I think it was the only one you put in capital letters and uh, larger font, which is the human rights of clones, which I thought was a very intriguing question, because my first answer was, why not? Of course we should grant clones human rights. And trying to think about it while the discussion here went on, I could only come up with two possible challenges to that notion, which would be first the black hole approach, the framers of the Constitution or whatever human rights declaration didn't think of clones, and as such they are not endowed with human rights. And the other one would be human li life begins at conception and clones are not conceived, which would be a more Christian challenge maybe to, to granting uh, human rights to clones. So are there any really serious legal challenges or is it, is it more an, an ethical problem or is it maybe a definition of what is a clone? Uh, maybe, I don't know, how technology is, uh, has, has uh, developed there. So that would be my question. What, what is the real legal issue there? Yeah, well, so I, I think, Fabian, you've identified the two core issues from my perspective. Number one is, if clones are a category, who is in that category? If you're born by an assisted reproductive technology, then we have dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds of children a year who are born by methods that did not exist even 10, 15 years ago. So those who have gotten a assist through science and is a, a increasing and increasingly large number. Will there be some qualitative difference when you have someone who is conceived without never having had any sort of connection to um, mother or child through the traditional methods? That's question number one. Question number two is the one you correctly identified, which is when does their life begin and when do their human rights attach and does it attach at conception? What constitutes conception? If you, well, if a, if a, if a couple that cannot conceive through a normal method, um, you know, um, fertilizes 10 eggs, freezes them all, has a successful birth by one of them and then destroys the other, uh, is that lawful abortion, or is that in some way a violation of some principle? It means going back and reconceiving that. You know, the, in the Supreme Court of the United States, they did this in terms of the trimester system. Guess what? The trimesters don't really matter, at least with regard to the safety of the mother, with regard to this issue. So the constitutional frameworks that have been applied are all in the context of traditional birth. All I'm saying is it's a, a massive uh, translation exercise. And what you add into the mix is that, you know, embryos could be preserved for hundreds of years. Um, and embryos can be created through the replication of stem cells. So it goes to the whole issue of the research that leads to it. I, I, I've looked and there's not much academic discussion of this issue. That this is one area a little bit like drones where the, and cyberspace where the technology is way ahead of the legal discussion. 
a gentleman in the last row of this room on my right. No longer? Then Frau Krieger is the last one. When I was listening to your presentation, which I found very elucidating, I wondered uh, whether I hadn't heard about two concepts of law, actually. One, a hard concept of law, where China would have to justify its measures in the South Chinese Sea before an unclosed tribunal and would be bound by law. Or uh, where an African warlord would be responsible before the ICC, which you are now supporting again, which I find very important. On the other hand, I, I heard you talking about the agreed outcome uh, with legal force or about new lawmaking uh, tools, um, which gave me the impression that you also had a vision of a softer uh, form of law. And I wondered uh, where does which form of law apply? Uh, is the hard law only for the warlords and for whom is the soft kind of law? Well, I would say to our German friends that if you want the United States to be governed by legal rules, you should aspire to have them further enmeshed in soft law instruments. Because the number of treaties that the United States will approve by 67 votes in controversial areas will be few or none over the next period. So the fact that the United States participates, sets up soft regimes, and agrees with those regimes as a matter of political binding us, but don't accept law, is to my mind bringing them closer into a law-governed situation. Uh, I'll give you another example, just a very simple one, which is that um, the United States will not ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child unless something very dramatic happens to our Senate. And the United States is now with Somalia, the only country that has not ratified. And Somalia's excuse was they didn't have an organized government. Now they have <laughs> just moved to ratify, so the United States is alone, except that South Sudan has been created, so they have not organized. <laughs> so the United States is still not alone. So a number of, about 10 years ago, the question arose, should the United States ratify the two optional protocols to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, one on the worst forms of child labor and the other on child soldiers? And we had a very difficult internal discussion within the United States and finally got the Defense Department to agree that they could, we could ratify and join these two treaties, these two specialized treaties. We went to the um, international body and our French colleagues said if you're not going to ratify the convention in chief we don't want you to ratify the specialized protocols <coughs> and one of the French delegates said to me why is it that Americans always want an a la carte approach to treaty ratification and I said you know uh, I've always noticed that if you get a chance to order a la carte, it's more likely you go to the restaurant. <laughs> and the more likely you are to go to the restaurant, the more likely you are to enter. So now we have been a party to the specialized protocols for 10 years. I just presented on it. We are now much more likely in the next 10 to 15 years to say there is no danger to our joining the big treaty the Convention in Chief. It has been defanged. Our colleague asked the question about the individual communications provisions of the human rights, the International Covenant on Civil and per Political Rights. If the United States is a member of the Human Rights Council for 10 years and finds it as to its, um, it, it has many positive uses, it's much more likely 10 years from now that the United States will move from this softer engagement to this harder engagement. So my answer to you is yes. I mean, in a world where everybody is able to enter treaties with equal ease, you might aspire to have everyone enter hard treaties. But <clears throat> if you have a world where the people who are outside can be softly enmeshed in those treaties, and through that soft enmeshment move into harder engagement, why not encourage that? Especially if you want the United States to be governed by these legal rules. And then finally, on the Arctic, there was no clear governing regime. 
important decisions about the future of the Arctic were being made in back rooms. And now through a set of soft norms and practices, the Arctic Council is the place where that debate and discussion is going on. And my view is that enhances the likelihood of reciprocity, of rule-governed behavior, of awareness how this will affect others, et cetera. So if you can bring the Goliath into the frame through soft law <coughs> and enmesh them in it, so much the better. I'm sorry that not everybody who wanted to talk got his or her chance. There is an opportunity to continue the conversation outside. Harold, thank you so much. Thank you all for your interest and your contributions. <laughs>